everyone. It is George Karos with a little solo episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I'm going to do something really special today. What I'm going to do is actually read the very first chapter in the book, uh, What Makes a Great Principal, which I co-wrote with my colleague and very dear friend, Allison Apsey. I am texting Allison right now. I wanted to make sure she was okay with me doing this because, you know, we're giving some content away in a book and we're hoping that someone will hear this and say, you know what, I really need to get my hands on the book. And even if you, you can't get the book, we're just hoping it helps that it, you know, maybe it's inspiring. It's a, a good, you know, podcast to listen to. Uh, we, we really loved writing this book. And one of the reasons we loved writing this book was it wasn't just Allison and myself. Uh, we actually got 15 contributors uh, to the book who are either current teachers, uh, current principals, or people that served in the role of principal because we didn't want to just hear, um, or actually, I guess we didn't want to just share from us. We didn't want to just hear our viewpoints because both of us have been as principal, Allison, much longer than I was. And uh, we, we do want to, we want to share some stories, some insights, some research, but we thought it was really imperative to hear from the people principal serve. That was really crucial to this book. And not only did we have teachers, we had students as well. And I will tell you, as I was reading the book myself and reading all the contributor chapters, I was thinking, oh, I wish I would have had this when I was a principal because just hearing the perspectives of teachers on what they thought made a great principal and the people that really made an impact on them was really, really powerful. So it was just a real pleasure to write this book. And I will be honest with you, uh, I don't write books just to write books. It's never been my thing. I don't want to just like, oh, I get, get another book out. Something has to like hit me or come to me. And Allison, when we were kind of going through this process, we, we talked about it and we really kind of stalled it for a year because I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't ready to write this. And then I read Allison's book, uh, Leading the Whole Teacher. And I just thought, wow, this is so good. I highly encourage you to pick up that book if you haven't. Uh, it, it is really, really awesome. And she just did such a great job. And it really started making sense to me on how we could actually approach this book and, and what it could look like. So we talked about it and I just had such a great time writing this, not only because I worked with Allison, but I just, I love, um, first of all, I love writing about my work as a principal. I love the topic. I think principles are so crucial to what we do. And I just had a great time. Every time I was writing, I would text Allison and say, I am just loving this process. I'm loving this. So uh, I can honestly tell you very sincerely, I know it's biased obviously because it's coming from one of the authors. This book is amazing. I, I'm so proud of it. And and I'm saying that like if you skip my parts, <laughs> it's it's amazing, right? Like now I hope my parts make it better too. But just hearing from Allison and hearing from, you know, these contributors, it was just really, really good. And I, I'm very, very proud of this book. So we just wanted to share and get it out there. The reception to it has been absolutely incredible. Uh, we love it. So I want to just share with you uh, the introduction and I'm going to read it. So I'm not going to be looking at the camera. So if you want to make eye contact, it might be a little bit weird because I'll be kind of looking off to the side because uh, because I'm reading this. But I want to also just read the introduction and give you some some just kind of behind the scenes, maybe some thinking. So I'm going to read a little bit and then maybe talk about why I wrote what I did. So here is the uh, introduction to um, uh, what makes a great principal. And I had the pleasure of opening the book. So here we go. Do schools need principals? That's literally what I started off with. Uh, I remember that this was a question being asked on social media by teachers back in 2015. And there were many conversations on why principals were not beneficial to a school community and perhaps even caused more problems than they solved. Uh, I, as an aside, social media, it was really fascinating. I first went on there when I was a principal and there wasn't very many principals on there. I could probably name a handful at the time. And it was like the best space to complain about principals because no one was there. But then I was like, hey, not a loss, so horrible. So it was just really interesting. Uh, I, I continue. A good friend of mine wrote a blog post on the topic, emphatically saying that school should, should could continue to exist without a principal. It may, in fact, even benefit from their absence. Now, in the history of education, as a school without a principal 
persevered and accelerated due to this reality? Probably. I called my friend after I read his post and I remember saying to him, you probably wrote that post not because you think schools would be better off without a principal, but because you never had a really good one. Was I bothered by this conversation on social media and by the post from my friend? Definitely. But it was not just because I was a principal at the time, it was because I had a great principal who not only altered the trajectory of my career, but I can honestly say my life, that one person changed everything. What is the difference between a leader and an administrator? For the past few years and the time of writing this book, I've been asking people within education the question, who is a great administrator you have worked with and what made them great? Unfortunately, too many times people can't think of one. It is an awkward moment, but there are lessons to be learned from their lack of response. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, a common theme emerges in the responses from educators uh, that I've asked over the years about the best leaders they have experienced. They brought out and saw something that I had no idea was in me. Uh, notice I that I asked the question, what makes a great administrator, not what makes a great leader? These are two very different questions. Some administrators are terrible leaders and other people who aren't administrators become unofficial leaders in moving their communities forward in a positive manner. If you think of the best teachers you've had in your lifetime, you might say the same thing you said about administrators. They brought out and saw something in me that I had no idea was there. Some of the traits of the best teachers and best principals are in fact the same. Uh, when the term leader is used in this book, it is not synonymous with administrator or principal. We define the term leader in the following manner. A leader is someone who has the ability to move people forward in a positive direction. Uh, as an aside, this is a conversation I've had with educators forever. Uh, I, I think off the top of my head, Dean Chereski can everyone be a leader? Well, if you think of leader in the traditional uh, mentality of what that uh, represented, no, like, you know, I, I understand that. But when you think about it, has the opportunity to move people forward in a positive manner, we have the ability to lead in all parts of our life. Uh, I know that sounds weird, but I've, I focus a lot on my health over the last few years. And I might be a leader to some people in that space, even though I'm not necessarily an expert because, you know, some people have reached out to me and said, hey, thank you for sharing this or sharing this insight because now I've started doing this as well. So that's kind of how we think about um, leader. Uh, back to the book. And as much as we'd love to talk about what makes a great leader, no matter the role, this book is focused specifically on what makes a principal a great leader. Although, my administ although any administrator, anyone who aspires to be in that position will benefit from what we share in this book, we wanted to focus on the role of the principal. I remember Todd Whitaker saying at a conference, when the principal sneezes, the whole school gets a cold. That couldn't be more true. But what is the opposite of that statement? When the principal takes Sudafed, the whole school no longer su suffers from nighttime sniffles, coughing, and aches. It just doesn't have the same ring. P.S. Sudafed does not pay us for the product placement. Hashtag not an ad. As someone who has refereed high-level basketball, I often think of the connection between that role and being a principal. In any sport, you know a referee is great when you don't notice them. They not only lead, but they, make the, they manage the game so well. And everything goes in a positive direction where the focus is on the game, not the official. It doesn't mean there isn't adversity, but the best officials know how to deal with it in a way where the focus is where it should be, on the players and the game. Unfortunately, if you're a bad referee, everyone notices, like everyone. The same is true for principals. The worst ones stick out and the best ones never get the credit for the impact they have on the little and big things in our schools. They often take their criticism for others and hand out the praise when they might be uh, the most deserving. No great principal has ever won an award and pulled a Snoop Dogg in the award ceremony and said, and most importantly, I'd like to thank me. As much as that statement could be true, they know that they are a large part of the success of the community, but their success is a direct result of the success of their community. There is no better person that I can think of who exemplifies this than my former principal, Kelly Wilkins. So now what I'm gonna do is just kind of talk about Kelly and the impact she had on me and really kind of how she embodies this book. And one of the things that was really, really powerful is sending it to her. And she didn't know I was writing this. Uh, she didn't know she was mentioning this, but the, the text I got when she opened it and read it, it, it really meant a lot because she had such a, a huge impact on me as a human being, not just... A teacher and I think that's when I think about some of the most uh, important people in my professional life they had a huge impact on my personal life so I start off with this there's just something about Kelly 
For over the past decade, I've written or co-written four books and 2,000 blog posts and recorded or been a guest on over 500 podcasts. All this content could have been titled, Everything I've Ever Learned About Education I Learned from Kelly Wilkins. She has been the biggest inspiration in my career, and when I met her, not only did my career change, but so did my life. I can honestly say I never thought much about principles and their role until Kelly came into my life. I really didn't think of the position more than that. It was just a position in the school. And sometimes you don't realize your former principals weren't that great until you get a principal who is exemplary. Kelly was that for me. The best way to cultivate the best talent is to find talented people. My first interaction with Kelly was an interview for a position at the school where she was principal. This is a brand new school, only its second year of existence, and Kelly was charged with opening it and, set it and setting the course for the community. I remember when applying for the position that it was a unique posting. It wasn't for a specific grade level or subject area. It was for a grade five to nine teacher. Of course, there were some job requirements posted, but it was really just a general posting with little information. At the time the job was posted, I knew I needed a change and I wasn't happy in my current situation. Not because it was a bad school or community, but I just felt I had lost my purpose. Teaching was something I, I did, but not something I was passionate about. I threw in an application, got an interview, and was so excited about the opportunity. As I entered the interview room, Kelly and the assistant principal, Carolyn Cameron, who also went on to be a great principal later in her career, had a list of 15 topics on a piece of paper. They told me to look the list over for a few minutes and then talk about five to eight things listed that I was passionate about. Um, th that was a strange process and very different from the question answer interview format that I was used to not only as a teacher, but in every profession. Something already felt different, uh, as an aside. I remember actually having the interview for a position that I was really excited about and it, it was, I think, probably at least 10 people that were on this gigantic table and they were all sitting around. And, and I was just sitting at one end and they each took a turn, asked me a question and there was no interaction. It was question, me give an answer and then just looking down. And as it went through and, and it just kept going and going and going, I just got, I actually remember becoming physically sick. I was sick for days after because I had so much anxiety. And to think about, what if I got that job and that was my welcome? That was the first thing is like, we put you through this really horrible process that's going to look nothing like what you do in schools. And when actually I talk about this, what I loved about this process with Kelly and, and, and Carolyn was this was something that was normal in my time with them. Like we would just have conversations and talk back and forth. So you kind of see that and do we put the people we're hiring in a great position, whether they get the job or not, or do we kind of put them in this, thing that's never going to really exist and we don't really get to know them it's just kind of like almost like a firing squad uh, back to the book I wish it, I could tell you great details about the interview but it was a blur I remember laughing crying and I'm not kidding and really feeling passionate about what I shared it felt like having coffee with good friends or colleagues more than an interview which was the point if you think of the t typical interview process it feels more like an inquisition than a conversation when I left the interview, I felt good about it, but it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my career, so I had no idea how to gauge how well I did. A few days later, Kelly called me and not only offered me a job, but also shared what my position would be. It was to teach the subjects that I was really good at and was most passionate about. The job was literally tailored to who I was, my strengths, and my passions. What I thought was just pure luck was actually very planned out. Kelly looked for the best people she could find and then figured out how we could match the best person possible and their skills with the needs of the school culture. You see, when you're looking for the best grade five math teacher, you might be giving up on the best teacher possible for community because you advertise for a very specific position. Not only did you probably be, <coughs> excuse me, not only did you probably deter people who'd be great for community, but you have made the job so specific that your hands are tied in the process. Kelly felt I was the best fit for the school community, and then she collaborated with her team to figure out how they could switch things up in their school and bring me in. When she offered me the job and told me about the position, I enthusiastically accepted. She asked me to keep it private because she wanted to let the other candidates know they didn't get the job and give them feedback to help them in the future. Kelly knew that any person in that process would probably teach students somewhere, and she wanted to set up the people who were unsuccessful in the interview to find success in another school. A few days later, I signed the contract and I couldn't have been more excited. Just as an aside, when you actually have an interview process with, you know, four or five, six people or whatever, and you know only one of them is going to get the job, not only does actually providing them feedback and actually having a conversation, trying to set them for success in the future, whether it's with your organization or another, not only does it actually help them become a better teacher, become better at whatever they're doing, 
It also is a, a, a great, I don't want, I don't know if marketing is the right thing, but imagine that you didn't get a job and then you advocate for the school or the principal that didn't give you the job. That says something right there. And I think, you know, I, I would have like, if I would have got that feedback, I would have been, I don't know if I would have been really happy. Maybe I would have been sucky about it, but I would have been an advocate because I was like, wow, like this is really good. I, one of the, um, one of the uh, people I really distinctly remember, she didn't get a job with me and I spent an hour with her giving her feedback. And she called me a week later and she said, I just got a job and there's no way I would have got it if you didn't help me. And she like advocates for me all the time, even though I didn't hire her. You know, that's a really good, and I learned that from Kelly. Um, next part, relationships and the importance of feeling valued. What was interesting was that I was really excited about this opportunity at a new school at Kelly, but just a month earlier, I'd been ready to leave education. I felt I had lost my passion. This new school was a last ditch effort to give it one more go. To be honest, I probably wouldn't have even applied, but I, I wasn't sure what else I would do. Within days of signing the contract, I received a call to interview for a job outside of school with a focus on educational technology at the Office of Education in my province. To say that this was a dream job for me would be an understatement. It was exactly the job I was hoping for, and I couldn't believe the timing. For years, I tried to get the interview with no luck. Then right when I signed a contract, an opportunity becomes available. It was like the ex-partner who broke your heart and then reaches out to you just when you finally got them. Oh, the torment. I knew I had to take the interview, but how could I do that within days of signing a contract? In my mind, I had two choices. Take the interview without Kel telling Kelly, who is really a stranger to me at this time, or tell Kelly about the opportunity and hope that I didn't get fired from a job I hadn't even started. I decided to go with the latter decision. Kelly had been so welcoming to me that I felt I owed her the truth. I dialed her number feeling like Eminem in a rap, bottle in the movie eight, uh, rap battle in the movie 8 Mile without the mom's spaghetti. She picked up. I reluctantly told her that I'd been offered an interview and I wanted to tell her before accepting it as a courtesy. I'll never forget what she said. George, if this is your dream job, you have to take the interview. If you get it, we'll be bummed for us, but happy for you. We'll find someone else to work here. But if you don't get it, we will be really excited about the opportunity to work with you. I would never want you wondering what if and, re and resenting your decision if you didn't take the interview and hated being here because of it. I promise you either way will be good. It wasn't just what she said, but also how she said it. I felt so amazingly valued and there's a huge difference between being valued and feeling valued. What an incredible feeling to know you are valued as a person who has hopes and dreams and to have someone who truly has your back no matter your decision. If this is how I was treated before I worked there, I couldn't imagine how good it would be once I did. Suddenly a third option appeared. I didn't even take the interview. I knew where I wanted to be. I, I cannot tell you, I actually distinctly remember I was in a car on that phone call um, talking to Kelly and I just, I never experienced anything like it. I just felt so appreciated and it just meant so much to me that there is a certain um, loyalty that Kelly got immediately from that moment because I you know she was willing to do what was best for me I was willing to do anything for her because of that next part being visionary through understanding what we can do together as I entered this new school the opportunity to see endless, which was something I had not really experienced it just felt different then I got my schedule part of it was teaching middle school math in a collaborative setting that was something I was excited about but the other half was being an educational technology facilitator who worked directly with teachers in a team situation where we'd open up opportunities for students through a collaborative process. That was exciting, but it, how it was scheduled, not so much. Kelly provided a schedule that had, time, that had times for me to work with math classes and then 40 minute blocks when I would work with individual teachers and their class once a week. It was seen as an opportunity to spread my strengths around to that staff, but the first thing I thought was, how can I possibly get anything moving forward in such a short window of time each week? It would be hard to build not only a connection with each class, but momentum. Although this was similar to what I had done in the past with other schools, it didn't mean that it made sense. My mom always told me that if you if you want something, ask for it. And the white worst you might hear is no. 99% of the time, I would agree with her. But having a temporary contract, I thought this might be the exception. I decided to ask Kelly anyway. Kelly and I met, and she asked for my thoughts on the schedule before I was ready to share them. She knew something was up. I told her that I thought it didn't really make sense to do 40 minute blocks with classes once a week. And I thought there could be a better way. Of course, when you say there's a better way, you might expect some, for someone to ask, well, what is it? Kelly asked, but I wasn't prepared yet with an answer. I thought I would share my concerns and she would either say no or fix it. I didn't think my input would be requested. 
One thing I know is that if you complain about a problem, when you are done complaining, it is still a problem. Only actions create solutions. Kelly said to me, go think about it and see if you can come up with a better way. Huh, that was new. I came back a week later and said, would it be possible for me to just work with one class for two to three weeks at a time and do some deep project-based work? I promise you that I will work with the teachers and classes the same amount, but instead of once a week, it would be every day for a couple weeks at a time, and then we rejoin them for another two or three week block later in the year. She loved and said, go for it. What weird utopian school is this where I have input on my schedule as a teacher on a temporary contract who hasn't even taught a classroom for a solitary second? Leaders need to be visionary, but they also need to be able to utilize the people they work with to create a vision of what school should and could be together. We often see vision as something that one person has, not something that is created together. Kelly knew her strengths and my strengths. Together, we could create something that we couldn't do alone. Maximizing resources through genuine ownership of the outcome. When I tell you that this was the best year of teaching I ever had, that would be an understatement. I often tell educators that we need to look forward and create the school of our dreams by looking back at our intentions when we first started. We often blame the system for wearing people down, but the system is made up of people. And if, and if that is true, I can have an impact and so can my principal. As the year neared to 10, Kelly asked me with, to meet me to discuss the opportunities for the following year. She brought me in and said, hey, George, we have this money in our budget for technology next year, and I want you to write up a plan of how we are going to use it. I looked at her confused and said, I don't think that is my job. Isn't that something you should do? In my entire career as a teacher, I had never been asked by the principal how we should spend money for the entirety of the school. Kelly returned the confused look and said, George, we hired you as the expert in educational technology for the school. So why would we make the decision when you have the expertise? This is part of the reason we hired you. You know when people say there are no dumb questions? Typically, that is said after someone asks a dumb question. The weird thing is that with Kelly, I realized that I just said, ask the dumb question. Isn't that something you should do? Made no sense in our world. As we were a team and decisions were made together, utilizing the expertise of the entire school community. I went off and worked on a plan for what we were going to purchase for the school, utilizing the budget I was allocated. Do you know how much pressure there is when you are making decisions as a teacher that will impact other teachers? I didn't want them complaining about the terrible technology choices they had access to when I was the one making the decision. So instead of making the decision on my own, I started asking other teachers their thoughts and hopes for what they could utilize in their classrooms. Some had amazing ideas and some needed guidance, but they all appreciated me asking. I came back with a plan. I will tell you, I was terrified. Kelly put me in a position where I was making decisions for others in my role and it gave me more ownership over the entirety of the school, not just the class I taught. She knew that how money was spent on stuff would either benefit or hinder the school, so she would defer to the experts. This was the first time in my teaching career where I felt like I was considered an expert in my own school. Maximizing resources isn't just about making decisions on what you purchase and how you utilize time. It is maximizing the people you serve to do that together. You can have all the vision in the world, but it doesn't matter when you don't have the resources to bring these dreams to fruition. As an aside, this is one of the key pillars that we talk about. And I think it gets kind of under uh, discussed because it's not really charming, right? It's not really exciting. Is that how do we actually think about resources? Um, there's never been a time in education where we're like, oh, we have so much money. Like it's not a thing. So we have to think about how do we spend our money? Like, you know, looking at budgets every single year. I know it sounds really, really boring, but you can have this vision, but it's like, okay, but like we need stuff to be able to do that. So how do you get, you know, how do you get the stuff? And we talk about that extensively uh, in this book. Next part. Once you stop learning, you're done teaching. When I tell you that was the best year of teaching my life, it was not because under Kelly's guidance, things started going downhill in a year or two. It was because I never made it to year two in that school. Remember, a year earlier, I'd been ready to quit teaching. The summer after my first year working with Kelly, it was because of Kelly's coaxing that I accepted a job as an assistant principal at a school in the district. Not only did I stay in the profession, but I doubled down and became an administrator. Because of Kelly, I can't imagine being involved with any other profession to this day. We often talk about how we live in an incredible time where we have access to all the information in the world. Although I agree, it is much more powerful that we have access to one another. After I took a position at another school, Kelly never hesitated to reach out to ask me and ask me for my advice in, in areas she knew I, I was very well versed in. 
Kelly, Kelly never looked at someone's position as a measure of their knowledge and wisdom. She was so incredibly ahead of her time because she was willing to learn from anyone and everyone, and she surrounded herself with the best. I remember sitting in a leadership meeting as an assistant principal and a group of longtime principals started joking with Kelly about me leaving her school so soon and how she couldn't keep anyone on her staff. Her response was a mic drop. This is one of my favorite Kelly moments ever. She looked at them and said, I would rather have someone amazing for one year in my school than have someone who is average for 10. She looked for the best people she could find and learn from them. And if she helped them to go on other positions, she knew she could find different people who would want to come work with her. Wouldn't you want your boss to bring out the best in you, even if that meant you would eventually leave? Kelly's legacy was in the people who are all over the region because her, of her direct influence on their acceleration of their careers, and they were loyal to her for that. If she called you, you would always answer. She knew who to go to for what and how to utilize their, their gifts to grow her own. She eventually became the deputy superintendent of the district and remained in that position until she retired. Never once did I ask her a question where she pretended she knew the answer. She either knew how to guide you or she would say, that's a great question. Give me some time. Let me see if I can get you an answer. She always got me an answer or knew someone who, who could help me. When I became a principal, I knew I didn't need to know everything, but I had to be willing to learn anything that could help the people I served. There was no better example of this than Kelly and her influence lives on me today. If I can make one-tenth of the impact Kelly made in her career, I would consider myself a success. From the viewpoint of those you serve. A question I've been asking Teach Forever is, would you want to be a learner in your own classroom? Some hear that question, are a bit offended, adamantly immediately answer, uh, yes. <laughs> it is not intended to be a one-and-done question, but something we think about constantly and try to understand from the viewpoint of those we serve. I fully admit I've had bad days as a teacher, for instance, those days I said, uh, the bell doesn't dismiss you, I dismiss you. Those were the days I sucked. <laughs> Kids were literally bolting for the doors to get out of my classroom as soon as possible those days. Yet on other days, they didn't even notice the time because they felt so interested and empowered in their learning. That was the goal, and to achieve it as much as possible is the standard. When I shared the question in a talk, a teacher said to me, this is, all something, uh, this is also something a principal should consider. Would I want to be a staff member in my own community? She was right. And that moment is one of the reasons we felt it was so essential to have staff and student voices represented extensively throughout the book. You can learn a lot from people doing your same job, but never neglect learning from the people under your care. So as you read this book, think about what principles you work for or have done, but also consider the principle you wish you had when you were a teacher. Too often ask some teachers with incredible leadership potential if they ever consider becoming a principal, and they will say, I don't wanna do the things a principal does. To which I respond, when you're the principal, you can do the way you want to do it. That's the beauty of the job. Obviously, there are certain requirements of the job, but there's also considerable flexibility. People tell me they would miss kids too much being a principal, to which I respond, that I was around kids all the time because I made it an integral part of my day. As you read on, think of these two questions. Who is the principal I want to be and who is the principal my community needs? If the answers to those questions are in the back of your mind as you read the ideas, research, and stories ahead, you all have the potential to be a great principal. That is the goal of the book. So, do schools need principals? Not necessarily. But would schools and people benefit tremendously from having a great principal? Absolutely. I remember talking to that same friend who wrote that post on why schools didn't need principals a few years later. And he had a different attitude. A new principal had come to his community and it changed everything. In my personal experience, I was lucky enough to enter a school that already had a great principal. And if it weren't for my job change, I probably could have written the same post as my friend did. But when a great principal enters a new community, every person gets a fresh start, but they also get a better start. I wanted to write this book with Allison, not because I was a great principal, but because I had one. And it made all the difference in the world to me, my colleagues, the community, and mostly the students. And that's why I was so passionate about what we wrote in this book. And I really hope um, you will uh, take a look at it. We really love writing this. And at the end of each um, at the end of each chapter, what's really beautiful, we wanted to make this really conducive to book studies to is we have questions built in there. So you can have conversations about this. Um, when we think about these five pillars, and you'll read them, you know, as you go through, one of the things that was really important to us was to share ideas, but ultimately defer to you to figure out the solutions, because we know, we don't know your community, you do, that's part of your role. And so 
we, we know that there's not just one way to be a great principal and there's not one personality type that could be a great principal. Um, if you get to know myself and Allison as you read the book, you'll see we actually are very different. And, and one of the nicest compliments I've received is that our styles of writing are very complimentary, but they're not the same because we have different approaches. But I think we've both did well, you know, in our roles as principal. I know for sure, I, I, I wouldn't say that for myself because I don't think I'm the person to determine that, but I know for sure Allison did. And really great evidence, one of her teachers actually wrote a chapter about Allison because she loved her so much. and. Allison asked me if that was okay. I said, absolutely. Like, that's who we want. If she, like, and she did a great job. Carrie Lasney did a, a, an amazing job. So um, we hope you can pick up the book. I hope you enjoyed uh, the first chapter. And even if you can't uh, pick up the book, I, I promise you it's, there's something for no matter what you do in education is beneficial. If you have a great principal or you know someone who wants to be a principal, I know this would be a perfect gift for them. But um, I really loved writing this book. I hope you love reading it. We'd love to hear from you. Anytime you share about it, uh, use the hashtag what makes a great principal check it out in the description down below thanks for listening have a wonderful day take care